I think that when I encounter requests either internally or externally for content, for what's going on, everyone wants to know what brands are growing, why they're growing, and they want a funny story about it. They want something memorable, anecdotal that they can hang on to. Explore the minds and marketing strategies behind today's winning brands and businesses. Tap into the power of the creator economy with Earned by Creator IQ. Here's Connor Begley. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Earned. Connor Begley here. And today I am interviewing Alex Rotz, the Director of Research and Insights at Creator IQ. Hello. Great to be here. I couldn't be more excited. And you guys might notice things are a little different than normal. Yes. Uh, do you want to describe what's happening here, Alex? Connor has taken me to a torture chamber, <laughs> and we are going to be working our way through 10 progressively spicier hot sauces with our boneless wings, courtesy of our friends at Buffalo Wild Wings. Connor, this is an original setup, right? You came up with this idea yourself, pure inspiration. This is all an original idea. No, we have stolen this idea shamelessly from the Hot Ones show. I'm a big fan of the show, and I think that Alex, for those that don't know the way that the show format works... I'm going to interview Alex, and as we ask these questions, we'll eat progressively hotter and hotter sauces. And if Alex is able to make it through all the way to the end of the 10th hot sauce, which apparently is the hottest pepper in the world at this point, he then gets to promote his new thing, which yeah. we are going to leave hidden until then. I noticed you weren't doing this with any CEOs. <laughs> <laughs> somehow the lowest net worth individual that you've ever had on this program gets to do the hot sauce challenge. Also the one that is directly within my organization. Yes. So. I'm doing this for my job. <laughs> so I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> All right, let's get started. So let's do the first hot sauce. I feel like we have to eat a hot sauce before I actually start answering questions. Yes. The first one up we have, and this was from season 22, is the buffalo hot sauce. Oh, it's a little thick. Let's shake this out here for a second. A bit congealed. So, I know, a little congealed. So this is the buffalo hot sauce. It's 1,800 Scoville units. And we will see how it tastes. Oh, you really lathered that on there. That is a lot. <laughs> it came out, quickly. Came we're, out quickly. We're going bold to start. Okay. Oh, boy. You yeah. did, too. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> Here we go. Last words. That's not bad. Not too bad. This is, ooh. <coughs> oh, no. no. At the start? This is I how know, you're I responding? Know. Wrong tube. Okay, let's start at the top. Tell people who you are. What's your story? I hope that all the listeners love the sound of me chewing. And that's going to be really <laughs> pleasant to listen to. So, my name is Alex Rawitz. Like Connor said, I am the Director of Research and Insights at Creator IQ. I was born on July 16th, 1994 at 3.07 p.m. It was a Saturday. I don't recall that, but so I've been told. Grew up in New York, came out to California for college. Never really saw myself working in tech or in beauty or in influencer marketing, any of the things on which I've made my career. But as I was approaching graduation, found a little company called Tribe Dynamics or encountered them. They were looking for English majors of all things. And I thought, well, that's cool that someone wants to employ English majors that I won't have to, you know, work at Starbucks for the rest of my life. <laughs> Tribe Dynamics was looking for market research and publications specialists. So people who had a writing and research background and who could talk about the trends within what was then the emerging influencer marketing space, particularly in beauty and fashion. And I knew very little about that, but I liked the fact that there was a company out there, a tech company that seemed to be growing, that seemed to have good leadership, that was oh. prior, seemed to, I mean, <laughs> keyword seemed, that was really trying to invest in the skills that I had built throughout my education and, you know, met with the people. I did not meet Connor in my interview process. I was the first employee that Connor was not there for. Things would be very different if he had been there. But almost eight years later, we're here. We're at Creator IQ now, as the lovely logo behind us shows. And it's been an incredible ride. I think we've grown along with the creator economy. We've grown along with not just beauty and fashion, but now food and beverage. Shout out to Buffalo Wild Wings. With media and entertainment, with professional sports, there are so many things that I have the opportunity to write about, so many things that we have the opportunity to research. And yeah, that's kind of my professional journey thus far. And it's culminated somehow... <laughs> 
in trying all these hot sauces. <laughs> so I know that for you, one of the things you didn't talk about is, you know, your own passion for writing outside of this topic. For those who don't know, Alex, he's a voracious reader, reads, I think, 150 to 175 books a year, can name 95% of them off the top of his head, which is probably more books than I've read in my lifetime. So what is it for you about writing that inspires you so much? You've said that it's your favorite thing to do in life. Mm. It's a great question. First of all, you should read more books. Um, <laughs> I have actually read a good amount, but that's yeah. a lot of books. Yeah. No, thank you for having that be one of the first things that the listeners know about me. So this guy's a freak. <laughs> you should know that. No, writing, I think, is my way of processing the world, my own life, my relations to other people things that I'm thinking about, things that I'm just purely imagining or speculating about. I've always been a very word-coded person, I think. Some people might be visual learners, some people might be social animals, however it is that you're wired. I think that as I move through the world, I'm perceiving things in terms of words, in terms of language. And the act that moves me and occupies me the most is that act of writing, of trying to make sense of everything that I'm encountering, everything that I'm feeling. I think what moves me the most as I encounter other things, other people, other pieces of media, is when someone has expressed a thought or conjured some scenario that resonates with me and has done that in language that I find elegant and compelling. If you had to pick your favorite three to five authors, who would they be? I want to be probably the first person to ever mention Gerald Murnane in the context of either Hot Ones, an influencer marketing podcast, certainly on Earned. I'm pretty sure no one has <laughs> certainly never shouted been him out. I had never heard the name before in my life. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, as we're recording this, his birthday is coming up February 25th. Happy birthday, Gerald. He'll be 85. He is an Australian writer who is unlike anything else I encounter. So you talk about how many books I read in a given year you notice a lot of repetition. You notice a lot of themes and a lot of styles that are very similar. I think he is genuinely and earnestly doing his own thing to a degree that no other writer I've encountered is doing. And I admire him greatly for that. And he's someone that I try to emulate in my own writing. Probably not in my day-to-day -day life because he's a bit of a hermit. I, I wanna get to that point at some some juncture you in my life. You aspire to be a hermit? Yeah. Once I'm, <laughs> once I'm done with my podcast appearances and uh, trying hot sauce on camera, I will drop off the grid and live right. life like him. So he's definitely one. Deborah Levy is another author I really love. She's a British writer. Every book that she does feels very different from the other books that she has done. So in the way that I was talking before about how when you read enough, you kind of sense certain themes and you sense certain plots or styles repeating, I think... Some authors are able to generate a whole career out of exploring kind of the same subject matter over and over again. I think Deborah Levy is someone who really challenges herself to explore new ideas, new characters, new sets of circumstances. But all of that is undergirded by her incredible prose and her insight and intellect and all of that. So she'd definitely be another one. Got to give a shout out to Kafka one of the OGs. I feel like I'm in one of his fever dreams right now. He could never have conceived of something <laughs> this uh, Kafka-esque, but he's kind of the foundation for a lot of modern literature, for a lot of that feeling of alienation, anxiety, and that sort of surrealness that pervades modern life. And I think he's unappreciated for how funny he is too. I think he's a very funny writer and he often conceived of his own work as being humorous so all of these and more I know we probably got to get to the next question I could talk about this all day these are people who inspire me inspire my love of writing and inspire the writing that I try to do but not in the context of creator IQ I would say that <laughs> next time you get a report if it seems a little Kafka-esque I probably didn't do a very good job with that one <laughs> what was the name of the first one again Gerald Murnane, M-U-R-N-A-N-E. Go buy his books. Okay, I'll check him out. All right, with that, I think you got to get on to the next, the next hot sauce. Let's do it. So number two, we've got Angry Goat Pepper Co. It's a blistered shishito pepper with uh, Scovels of 5,800. So this is about triple what the last one was, okay, which I put... coughed in the last one, so that's yeah, concerning. Three coughs at least. You put about the same amount of sauce on this one, too. I did. Probably far too much. We're going to find out. All right.
Very mild. Yeah. That's tasty, actually. I mm -hmm. like it, but it's not too spicy. It's got some good flavor to it. Mm. So in terms of your own kind of writing style, I think one of the reasons that I had you on here is you had an incredibly successful newsletter that we've watched, right? So how to build brands and influence people is the name Habib. Habib. I believe is the official yes. name. <laughs> it's but, preferred uh, name is Habib. What is it about that? Like, why do you think, and to put some numbers on it, I think it's in the last, you know, since we've done it, it's generated 4X what the previous periods were, right? So it's like quadruple what we were doing previously. What is it about that newsletter that has been so successful in your opinion? And how do you approach kind of writing that for others that are considering writing a newsletter? Right. So I think there are several things there. First is we send it to a lot of people. So that helps with the open <laughs> rate. Um, it's a numbers game. But I think it solves that immediate need for content that people are looking for. And it's funny because in my sort of self intro, I talked about how I didn't know much about influencer marketing, didn't know much about beauty and fashion, any of that. When I started out at Tribe Dynamics eight years ago, I also didn't know much about newsletters. I'm not really a subscriber to newsletters in a lot of ways. But I think that when I encounter requests either internally or externally for content for what's going on, everyone wants to know what brands are growing, mm -hmm. why they're growing, and they want a funny story about it. They want something memorable, anecdotal that they can hang on to. And I think what works with Habib is that I'm always looking at it. Yes, that is the name, <laughs> Habib. Thank you. What works with the newsletter is that we're always approaching it from that standpoint of there is a unique growth story to tell for every brand. And it can be across verticals, which I think helps expand its audience and helps expand its interest. Mm -hmm. But it is always coming from the point of I, as someone who, you know, his interests lie outside of this space, found this to be an interesting story and found this to be compelling. And so I would only try to tell a story within the newsletter that I thought was worth telling for those reasons. Have you thought at all about what stories you want to tell kind of in your own book, in your first book? Have you written one yet? I think I've written about seven, uh, depending Whoa. on how you would count that as a book. I wrote a novel in high school that is going to never see the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> is it due to quality or content or both? Probably both. I mean, it's podcast friendly. It's just not a very good book. It's a sophomore effort. But no, I, I'm writing books consistently, books or short stories. I always have some kind of project I'm working on. Right now, I'm editing two novels that I wrote last year. And what's the process for writing a book? What does that look like for you? I don't know. A lot of people get very bogged down, I think, in process questions. I have an idea that I find compelling or something that's kind of stuck in my mind that I want to explore more. And I'll map out some scenes. I'll map out some kind of broad movements through chapters. I'll know generally the point where I want things to finish up. I'll kind of sit down and think about it. And then you write it. And I write by doing. I try not to procrastinate or get too bogged down with too much of the mechanics. I think the story, and this is true with Habib as well, it will find its own way to express itself as you sit down and you map out and realize this is actually what needs to happen to get from point A to point B. I'm curious, as we get this third one lined up, mm. have you tried promoting any of them? Have you tried selling any of them? How does that work? How do you find a publisher? Mm. So I've sent one of these novels out for submissions to literary agents. I guess there are kind of two main ways that you can try to make this happen is you get an agent who's interested in it and can then kind of pitch it to publishers, publishing houses, or you come up with a publishing house that accepts unsolicited admissions or submissions rather. So I tried a little both, didn't get too much traction with that. I've had short stories published in literary journals. So I've had six with potentially a seventh pending. I'm in talks with editors somewhere. So that's always exciting and that's gratifying and all of that. But I think that generally publishing like anything else is a pretty nepotistic business. And that's not to say that that doesn't mean that good work doesn't see the light of day or that everything that is published is bad. It's just it is very much about who you know. So if there are any listeners who know any literary agents out there, talk to me. I know someone I can connect you with. She wrote Under the Italian Moon. She's got like 20,000 reviews on uh, not exactly slightly different format. I was going to say just... <laughs> 
<laughs> All respect to her and respect to any writer who's out there grinding and working hard. Under the Italian Moon, just from the title, probably not too much my cup of tea. <laughs> and no, it's quite good. It was about her grandmother who grew up in Italy under Mussolini. thought you were going to say under the moon. No, no, no. Under Mussolini, who at the time had put in some pretty severe restrictions on women. I think they're actually forcing them to have children, essentially. And so more of your cup of tea than you'd expect. Right. As, as, as soon as you get to like a bleak circumstance, I'm like, oh, say more. <laughs> All right. Let's eat to the next one here. Right. So this one, we've got the Piscaya, which is spicy, sweet passion fruit. And this apparently is three times as strong as the previous one. So we'll see what happens. Okay. Fairly mild. Mm. I like that. That's really tasty. <laughs> you don't have to eat the whole thing. Yeah. Also, <laughs> I want to point out for anyone who's just listening to this. Connor Bagley is eating like half of his wings at best. <laughs> you don't have to eat the whole thing. Of course it's you do. Gonna take a bite. I'm not eating 10 wings. I thought eating 10 wings was the whole point. <laughs> no, the hot sauce is the point. Not the. No, the, I see a lot of hot sauce on your plate too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm eating like half the hot sauce. Okay, let, let it be known he's eating half the hot sauce. <laughs> I'm putting a lot on. So you've studied a lot of brands in terms of a lot of brands within the influencer and creator marketing space. And obviously, you've seen a lot of those brands grow. You write about a lot of those brands. What would you say are the common patterns across those that, that succeed? So I think there's several things, which I think I've said several times now is the beginning of an answer. Obviously, brands that have mastered their influencer marketing strategies are working first and foremost with influencers who have an organic affinity for that brand. This is something that we preached for a long time at Tribe. And I think it remains true and will always be true as long as influencer marketing is a thing. The people who are already talking about you, people who are already passionate about your product, your mission, whatever it is that makes your brand special, those are the people that you should target and pursue relationships with. So the brands that chase a big figure who's somewhat extraneous to that brand's underlying mission, someone who you have trouble thinking would actually use that product or have an affinity for it, those are the brands that get in trouble. And that I think produce content that doesn't really resonate with social media users. So that's one thing. I think additionally, you can look at it from the metrics standpoint and talk about the key metrics that you look to for brands that are growing. So engagement is one. I think that engagement even more than impressions. So that's essentially how many people are interacting with your content versus how many people are just seeing your content who might encounter it on social media. It's more important, I think, and a greater harbinger of success, that more people are going to be engaging with your content, are going to be liking, commenting, and sharing it versus just seeing it. If you have a wide audience, that's great, but that doesn't guarantee that your brand is going to have staying power. So I'd rather be in the position of a brand that is killing it with engagement and killing it with retention. So how many people in your community are continuing to post about you time and time again? I'd rather be in that position than a brand that works with some celebrity works with some powerhouse creator, but the resulting content is more advertorial, more like SpawnCon, and something that really sort of dies after its first initial cycle. And you can't really see that partnership reviving anytime soon. Yeah, it's, I'm having a really hard time listening to you because I'm thinking about how many chicken wings you've eaten here. I have eaten, <laughs> I have eaten so three <laughs> nuggets. Thank you for that uh, cogent response to my well thought out answer to that, Connor. I appreciate that. I couldn't the get whole it off time. my mind. Yeah. I, I looked over at your plate and I was like, where did they all go? And I was yeah, like, is yeah. he eating all for, of them? For all of our YouTube <laughs> subscribers, let's make sure we pay attention to the plates here and see who's in the clean plate club and who's not. <laughs> I'm not eating the whole thing. What's wrong with uh, eating 10 wings? I thought that was the point of this. <laughs> okay. And let's get the fourth hot sauce out. So for this one, we've got the Los Calientes Barbacoa, which supposedly is double what the previous one is. For those that don't know exponentials, we seem to be doubling every time, So, which is a little We're, concerning. We tripled a few times too. Yeah. So this is a good math lesson as well. <laughs> I can smell this one coming I off know. my plate. This one's a little... I think this is not going to be too bad. A little hotter. 
I'm unimpressed so far. I don't I think know. any of these have been very hot. Mm -mm. This is the first one that I've actually like, I can taste a little bit yeah. of heat. They're all quite flavorful as far as hot sauces go. Like I think they're very good. This one maybe has a bit more of that aftertaste to it of a yeah. spice, but. It's one of those things where yeah. it's going to build up over time. What are some of the brands that you are, you think are the most interesting right now that you really like writing about research? So I might just be in a chicken frame of mind, but I think Raising Cane's is doing really well. Yep. They were one of my surprises as I started writing the newsletter because I suppose I just am not really their target demographic, maybe, but I wasn't encountering a lot of their advertisements or I didn't know what the strategy for Raising Cane's would be. But they are absolutely crushing it, both with high profile creators. So they have someone like Post Malone, who's done a lot of work for them. And what I was saying before about bringing in some kind of extraneous celebrity, you might think that Post Malone would be that for Raising Cane's. But he genuinely loves the product. He works with them in a very consistent and collaborative basis. They do cool things together, like they opened up this pop up that's all Dallas Cowboys theme because he's a big Cowboys fan for some reason. Sorry to him. But they do great work not only with him, but with some of the smaller scale influencers as well. And one of the key things that I look for when I'm looking at a brand is when they have a top hashtag, what is that top hashtag? Is it about their own brand, for example? Is it just hashtag brand name? Is it hashtag ad? That's pretty bad if it's the top hashtag is hashtag ad. Sometimes for like a beauty brand, hashtag rare beauty can be even more than beauty brand X because rare beauty is just that big. But if you ever have an ambassador themed or campaign specific hashtag, that is a good sort of directional indicator. So I think Kaniac ambassador is their top hashtag consistently over any time period. A maniac, but for yes, 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 yes. <laughs> that is something that I've seen not just with Raising Cane's, but with other brands that are doing very well with their influencer programs. So they really impressed me just with that. And that was a fun thing to uncover for the newsletter. I had mentioned Rare Beauty. We give them props all the time. They deserve it. They're doing excellent work within the beauty space. Road Skin is crushing it. Really enjoyed the collaboration that they did with Krispy Kreme. That was another fun newsletter to write. That was the first newsletter that actually kind of blew up and got some of those big numbers. I think people were really curious to know about that campaign. And then more recently, on the sort of theme of Road Skin and Krispy Kreme, where you have these unconventional brand mashups, we're seeing more and more of that, of collaborations across different verticals. And one that I liked recently was Balenciaga and Erwan. So Erwan is a big LA cult grocery store. And when I say cult, I don't mean just that it's cultishly popular. I mean, it's actually legitimately a cult. Um, <laughs> No, don't sue us. It's not a cult. I hear they're it's great. Sort of, it sort of is. The, smooth, the smoothies are great. They're $20, but you get a lot. I heard they're 25 or 22 Probably. Yeah, Inflation. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. But they collaborated with Balenciaga, which is not a mashup that you would initially expect. But when you see it, it makes perfect sense. Balenciaga was trying to do something more SoCal themed. They had a show down here in December. They got Kim Kardashian. They got Erwan bags, which are their own kind of status symbol. And when you lay it all out like that, they couldn't have done something that was more SoCal. So props to them. And I think more and more brands are understanding that creating that viral moment, there has to be some degree of creativity and insight to it. And you're a big fan of SoCal, right? That this is your favorite place to be. <laughs> you know, I'm so happy in Los Angeles. It's amazing. Uh, every day I wake up and I think, God, I love being here. You did go to a rival school that didn't get along with a lot of the L.A. schools. So well, our thing, I, I went to Stanford University uh -huh, cool. for those who put stock in such matters. Our thing's Berkeley. You know, I'm the L.A. schools were sort of an afterthought. Yeah, I guess so. Well, let's get on to the next one. So we've got the power jab, which is not quite double. Fifty five thousand Scoville units. And it says this has a unique blend of Filipino flavors with a punchy mix of Italian, Jamaican round, and Asian teardrop peppers. So we'll see. Maybe this one will actually start to kick in a little bit. We'll see. Maybe you'll actually eat all of this one. Absolutely not. Good. Does have some spice that builds, but mm -hmm. overall not so bad. No. 
The last one lingered for a little while. This one's lingering for a little bit more, which would be what I'd expect at about five. Yeah. So for you, you know, you've been in this industry now since 2016. You're closing in on almost eight years. How have you seen it evolve from 2016 now to 2024? The evolution has been vast. It has been as exponential as the heat of a hot sauce, one might say. <laughs> I remember coming in in 2016, interviewing a tribe. Marissa Wren, who was the head of market research and publications at the time, sat me down and we watched a video together as part of my interview process. It was a Nikki Tutorials beauty video. And I probably should have done more prep for the interview because I had never actually watched a YouTube tutorial video before. But I watched it and, you know, it clicked pretty quickly. Like, oh, these people are your friends who have some expertise in a certain area. Usually it was beauty at that time. And they're giving you good advice about these are the brands to use. These are the products to use. This is how you achieve that certain look. And I thought this is very intuitive then. Like, clearly this is going somewhere. And I remember pretty quickly after I started, there was a collaboration with Bunny Meyer, the graveyard girl, who was a big YouTuber. And that was one of the first times that a beauty brand worked with a creator, or at least it seemed like one of the first times. It was being treated in social media discourse as this kind of culminating moment that was validating the fact that creators had arrived. You know, that someone could go from the level of a fan with no affiliation with a brand to having creative say over a campaign around that product. Now, influencers are founding their own brands, and those are some of the most successful ones. Influencers are not just collaborating on products, but they're key to the marketing behind many of these brands. So to have seen it within eight years go from kind of this hyper-specific thing that was just receiving validation to an entire arm of a marketing strategy to an integral portion of that strategy has been remarkable. And, you know, corresponding with that has been the move from beauty and fashion to all kinds of verticals. So we were talking about raising canes before, but we see it in professional sports. We see it in retail. We see it in media and entertainment. We see it in tech. Every industry is working with influencers in some capacity. I think that same process by which we saw the nature of these collaborations change within beauty and become more involved, we're going to see that with these other verticals as well. So those verticals are kind of going through those early gestational movements that we saw in beauty, you know, circa 2018 or thereabouts. Yeah, I mean, it's become a sizable portion of like the economy, right? And I think it's become, I think to go from something that I remember writing an article about how I hated the word influencer, and I still kind of do in some ways, but nobody knew what it was, to now it's just part of the lexicon. It's a pretty wild evolution to be kind of in the middle of over the course of a decade, right? Which is, in the scheme of things, a fairly small amount of time. Absolutely. Just the whole notion of a creator economy wasn't a thing when I started out, but or when you started out, certainly. I mean, Tribe was founded in 2012. That was really just the tipping point of all of this. Yeah, it's pre-Instagram, which is kind of wild. Yeah, what were you looking at? Pinterest back then? <laughs> Facebook, Facebook, Facebook and Twitter. Okay. All right, let's get up to the next one. So what is our sixth one here? So the sixth one is the Marshall Whiskey Smoked Ghost. I don't like ghost, probably ghost pepper. It says each ingredient shows the expertly crafted sauce. It has whiskey, white balsamic, and date syrup, plus smoked ghost pepper heat. Let's give it a shot. This one feels less than the last one. Yeah, I'm wondering if this is going to build or something because right now, not so bad. No, I think the eighth is the one that we have to be concerned about. But this, they do often like... Sucker punch you. Yeah, 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 yeah. It builds over time. Okay, so let's get into the topic of history. You are one of the people that I think knows most... Ooh, start to feel a little bit. A little bit? Yeah. Drink, drink your milk. Yeah, yeah. The uh, So you're a big history buff. So they tell you know, me. Yeah, you know more about history than... Pretty much anybody else I know. So I'm curious, what is your favorite period of history? It's interesting. I don't really think of it, my interest in history as being one that's dictated by period so much as particular figures or incidents. You know, I, I think that I'm very much a wide but narrow kind of person in terms of my history. There's not one 
aspect, like a Civil War buff who can tell you about all the battles and all the generals and details and that. I think I've always been interested in history growing up. I was interested in ancient Greece. That remained throughout my sort of educational days when I was more interested in the philosophy in addition to the actual composition of society at that point. Moments of transition and moments of change, historically speaking, are always different. I suppose you could say that everything is changing at all times, but there are points where that certainly accelerates. So the Industrial Revolution or early periods of colonization where you have one society encountering another are always pretty interesting to me. And I do like American history. It feels a little more local. Political history, things of that nature are definitely points where I can kind of hone in on. And as you'll recall from my president's learning years and years ago, I think circa 2017, the U.S. presidents, who I can name in order and I can name their vice presidents. I don't think we're going to get to that on the podcast, but I didn't have a lot of friends growing up. So that was kind of <laughs> that's kind of how I spent my time. Not like now where I'm reading 150 books a year. I have tons of friends. Yeah, they're my friends, you know, Gerald and Deborah and Franz. They're all my friends. No. So I think U.S. politics, presidential history, that is one area where certainly the trivia, I've retained a lot of that. Well, let's get into some of the trivia, but I'm going to keep us moving here. So this one, this is the ginger goat. There's 110,000 Scoville units. So this would be double what the number five was. It says sizzling into the seven spot with a blend of super hot chilies, tart mango, citrus, lemongrass, and the subtle sweetness of star anise. Very poetic. Oh, there you go. Let's give it a shot. Not immediate. You kicked in the last time. Your particular interest in presidents, who's your favorite president and why? In terms of the one that I think did the best job, I'll be unoriginal and say Abraham Lincoln. Very controversial choice, I know. But you know what? I, I just think I think ending slavery was the right call. I'm willing to go out on a limb and say it. Yeah, good job winning the Civil War, all of that. In terms of ones that I find most interesting from either a biographical standpoint or people who I feel like are forgotten by history. I've always, I've always had a soft spot for James K. Polk, not necessarily his policies, but him as a man and him as his period within history. Like I said before about transitional periods in history, he was kind of a transitional president. He was a Jacksonian Democrat. He was a disciple of Andrew Jackson. He, like Jackson, was from Tennessee. And he was the guy who Manifest Destiny happened under his watch. Mm. And so that was the point at which America became or started to prefigure a lot of its modern shape. The Mexican-American War was his sort of early attempt at local colonization in terms of taking over vast swaths of Western territory, including California. So anyone who's a citizen of this great state has their legacy impacted by James K. Polk. He was a very intense guy, and I think that regardless of your opinion of his policies, I can appreciate the fact that he did something that no modern politician, I think, no modern presidential figure will ever do, which is he said exactly what he was going to do when he was running for president. He accomplished it in four years by being a very effective administrator and then stepped down because he figured there was no need for a second term. And about 100 days after he was no longer president, he was no longer alive. He died very quickly after. And I think that put a pause on his historical legacy to some degree. But interesting guy, I think, for the impact that he had on American history and the modern world, he's somewhat underappreciated or underknown. What did he do that was so impactful? Well, the place that we're sitting used to not be America, and now mm -hmm. it is, and so... That was Jimmy. He did that. So yeah, Manifest Destiny, Mexican-American War. There are some other domestic policies that he was involved in. I mean, he kind of continued with punting on the issue of slavery. And there's a question of, was that a point at which some greater compromise could have been reached? But I do think that he was kind of that transitional figure that I've spoken about before from the last of those true Jacksonian Democrats into something new in the 1850s. This is the one that is supposed to be terrifying. 
You got to <laughs> eat the whole thing. <laughs> All right. I will pick the smallest one and I will eat the whole thing. Fair enough. I will say, honestly, up to this point, I feel pretty good about us. I think we're doing well. I don't know how much bomb I want to put on this here. Hubris. <laughs> right by before eating this. Yeah. yeah. That's what it's oh, like. everything's going great. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be like this forever. So this is the one that says, to bomb beyond insanity. It's, this is a natural version. And so we'll see. I gave myself a hefty portion here, so. You did? Yeah. All right. <laughs> good, good luck to us both. Cheers. Cheers. Not impressed. <coughs> Me neither. I mean, it build, <laughs> It definitely builds on you. Mm-hmm. It's got a more bitter flavor. It's definitely the least tasty one so far. Yeah. I don't think that I would put this on anything. And all the other ones I would actually use. Yeah, you can feel it building. Yeah. I think these celebrities are wimps. This doesn't feel that bad. Celebrities? Wimps? <laughs> okay. What is the most obscure fact that you know? About anything? I mean, <laughs> that's a broad... there, there are certain facts about myself that no one else knows. So <laughs> that's pretty obscure. It's a good question. You doing okay over yeah, there? Yeah, I'm doing well. <laughs> Sucking in air? <laughs> when your breathing becomes audible, usually that means you're not doing so great. That's an obscure fact that I know. Okay, one thing that I think is interesting, this is a linguistic fact, is that the word orangutan, so the famous monkey, that comes from a, a Malay dialect in Indonesia where orangutans are native to. And orangutan in that dialect means man of the woods. I can still hear you breathing. <laughs> and what's interesting about that, like the... Dutch colonizers who settled there heard that and adopted it and it becomes a loan word and all of that. Evidently, the native people didn't refer to orangutans by the word orangutan. That just meant man of the woods and it was applied to the monkeys. But whatever they actually called those monkeys was something else. I feel like I had a really hard time hearing what you were saying. I've been thinking too much about my mouth. This is... Not the first time that I have given what I thought was a pretty cogent and well thought out <laughs> answer. And you're like, I'm sorry. I was distracted by something else. D to, the, to, listen, to the listeners at home, hopefully uh, that fact enlightened you. I feel like distraction is one of my defining attributes, unfortunately. I can vouch for that. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. How are you feeling? You are remarkably stoic over there. I feel fine. The bomb doesn't taste great, but... Wasn't as bad as I was expecting. Interesting. I'm impressed with your heat tolerance. You're doing all right, too. Oh, I'm doing all right. But that, I felt that one. Okay. This is another viscous one that we've got this over one's here. pretty thick. I'm a little nervous about it. Oh, there we go. Okay. So this one. And you you finished that wing. Good I did. I did. I'm not going to finish any of the others, but I did that one just for you. Thank you. Okay. This one is Dawson's hot sauce. And this one looks... Really concerning. So the last one was 135,000. This one's 620,000. So I'm a little nervous. It says, Our friend Brody Dawson achieves both one of a kind flavor and head banging heat in this number nine. Seven hot or pot peppers plus sweet maple syrup, sambuca, and fennel seed. Fennel seed. So Fancy. we'll see if this is four times as hot as the last one. I'm really, really hoping it's not. I'm hoping that it is. <laughs> the sweetness is nice. Mm. It's funny. I actually can taste the fennel. You can? Yeah, if you really yeah. focus on it. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about your predictions. So obviously we're in the influencer marketing business. What do you think is going to happen in the coming, oh boy, uh, the coming years? Where do you think things are going to go? What do you think is going to change? What do you think is going to stay the same? I think influencer marketing will remain important and remain something that many brands do, which is good news for you and me. I'm probably contractually obligated to say that. Uh, this influencer thing, it's blowing over. It's not going to last. But no, I, I think that we're going to see what we're already seeing to some degree is an acceleration towards authentic content, which sounds like an oxymoron in the context of advertising overall. But there has certainly been a noticeable shift from the era in which Instagram was the primary platform and everything was very aspirational, 
I see you with the jagged <laughs> intakes of mouth breathing over there just every few seconds. <laughs> There's been a shift from that aspirational, very lavish, luxe kind of lifestyle thing being what I would see everywhere to a shift towards kind of goofy, authentic content. And I think that we're going to continue to see that as that remains the defining kind of aesthetic and preference for Gen Z. And I can't speak as much about Gen Alpha, but I would imagine that as they enter the marketplace, there would be something quite similar to that. And in addition to that, I think that short form video is here to stay. The overlay of certain short form videos with text, with other multimedia elements is something that's been very noticeable as I've been looking at content and reviewing it over the last eight years. So I think our attention spans are going to get even worse, which I bemoan somewhat. But again, good news for the bottom line. It's going to be keeping us in Hot Ones sauces. So can't complain. Yeah, I think the short term video thing will keep happening. I think our attention spans will get shorter. What? What? It was a joke. <laughs> exactly. I think I think I'm was underestimating the heat on that last one. You seem to be perfectly fine though. I'm chilling. Wow. I'm really impressed. We got to get you in some hot wings or hot eating contests. No, we don't. No, we don't. Yeah. We can keep this going. This can be your shtick. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> All right. What do we have here? The so last one. Up here, we have the last dab experience. Welcome to the top of the mountain. Don't touch your eyes. Oh, yeah. Towering new heights thanks to the Smokin' Ed's iconic Pepper X, now officially the world's hottest chili. And I'll finish my thought before I do that. I think that short form video will continue. I think you're right in terms of people being more and more like what what has happened is not going to unhappen. Like the genie's not going to go back in the bottle. We're not going to suddenly start watching TV shows and uh, listening to the radio quite as much as we used to. I think we're still going to be watching TV shows. Yeah, I guess so. Just a different format, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I won't. Um, I don't watch TV, but other people will. Yeah, yeah, Okay. All right. Let's get to the last one. We made it, All I right. think. It's right? been a pleasure. Cheers. Yeah. And this one says TBA, but supposedly it's hotter than the last. This one's a bit spicy. <laughs> okay. And now that we've gotten to the end of the show, why don't you promote what you are here to promote? Drink milk, everybody. Helps build strong bones. <laughs> If you love how to build brands and influence people as a newsletter, you're going to love it even more as a podcast. Soon we'll be debuting a 10 to 15 minute audio version of how to build brands and influence people. And it's going to take some of the elements that we have in the newsletter each week, some of that same text and add to it, add new elements, have it be listenable digestible, easy. Connor is not doing great over keep here. Keep going. Keep going. We're almost there. I mean, I, it, it's sneaking up on me too. The more I speak, I think the more the oh. heat comes to me. <laughs> uh, so anyway, yeah, there, we're, I'm going to have a podcast. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing this. You should listen to it. It's going to be fucking great. It's going to be fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Wow, that last one's hot. Okay. And uh, we did it. We made it. We did make it. You didn't eat all your nuggets, but... That's we... okay. Oh, by the way, he's too wimpy to eat wings, so we ate the yeah, wings. I, I'm the wimp here. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Bye. Be a friend, tell a friend, and subscribe. Earned by Creator IQ. Creator IQ is your all in one solution to grow, manage, scale, and measure your influencer marketing program. Ready to unlock the power of the creator economy? Get started with a demo today at creatoriq.com.